Mitch Hescox has been lots of things. One, for 14 years in the coal industry, right? Yes, correct. So he knows of what he speaks. Also been a pastor for how long? 18 years. 18 years, okay. Pastor, coal industry. Now he's the, the president, leader, CEO, all those things of the Evangelical Environmental Network, which is the largest, uh, uh, most influential organization in the evangelical world to be working on creation care, stewardship, and climate change. And that means they have an extensive grassroots presence around the country, 200,000 mm -hmm. people respond to you, it's, that's amazing, and a presence here in Capitol Hill, trusted at the EPA, the White House, Congress, by Republicans and Democrats. So he has a presence on the Hill in Washington, D.C. and around the country. And uh, uh, a big part of the work is working with younger evangelicals. A young guy known named Ben Lowe has been their, uh, what's Ben's title? He's your young evangelical environmentalist guy. Yeah, we just gave him a promotion. He's now the senior director of outreach. He's a senior director of outreach. <laughs> and uh, he's an amazing young guy out of Chicago. He even ran for Congress once, mm -hmm. uh, just to make a point about the climate. And he didn't win, but he put the issue on the agenda. So they're attracting really impressive young people, young staffers around the country. And uh, uh, Mitch is really, I think, uh, becoming a voice and a presence in the city and around the country, and in particular, why Christians and why those who are evangelical and care about the Bible should care about God's creation and climate change in particular. So it is a great uh, blessing to have him, and I'm pleased to introduce Mitch Hescox. Thank you, Jim. That's Well, it's great to be here, and thank you to Jim for inviting me. and. Uh, Actually, I can remember when Jim had a ponytail. <laughs> I'm not sure he even remembers that, but I certainly do. Well, what I'd like to talk to you today, and everything that I say in sort of this quasi-lecture time is going to be interactive, because I don't like to be a talking head. So I wanted to engage us and to talk about this issue that really is very critical. But before I get started, is there anyone in this room besides for Jim and I that's over the age of 29? <laughs> One person. Barely. Julie's barely, barely. over <laughs> and, the, and the reason I mention that is if you're 29 years of age and younger, you've never lived in a world that was not hotter than the 20th century average on each month. And that's through October, or through September. I haven't checked the October numbers, which will be coming out next week. But just think of that. For 29 years, the Earth has been warmer than the entire 20th century. Climate change is real. And we're going to talk about that today. And, and, and maybe before I, I, I really go into the biblical why, I'd like to just to picture something in your head. How many of you know the two closest planets to the Earth? One's called the red planet. What's, anybody know its name? Mars. Mars. What's on the other side? Venus. Venus. And do you know that there's a difference between the Earth and Venus? Do you know what one of the biggest differences is? Is the temperature. Venus is hot. I mean, it's a living sauna. And Mars, on the other hand, is frigid. And the biggest difference between the two is the solar radiation? Would you bet on that? Well, it's not. If you look at the cloud cover versus that do in the reflective things, both Venus, the Earth, and Mars all receive about the same amount of solar energy to the surface. So what's the difference? It's a little thing called the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. For me, God gave us a wonderful planet that was created to have about 280 parts per million of CO2. This year, for the first time in human recorded history, we broached the 400 parts per million. And if you look at Mars, it's about 50 or 60 parts per million, and Venus is off the charts. 
That level of, of carbon dioxide is a blanket. And that's the easiest way to think out of it. And when you get hot and you put more blankets on top, what happens to your body? It gets hotter. And that's what's happening to the earth right now. And so just think about that in terms, and, and if you don't think just one little denier's argument that's out there sometimes, if you don't think that 400 parts per million, per million of CO2 is meaningful, how much carbon monoxide, you know, the stuff that comes out of incomplete combustion, how much carbon monoxide does it take to kill you? How much is that? If you get exposed to about 150 parts per million of CO for a half an hour to 45 minutes, the chances are you will be dead. Small things do matter. And I guess that's what I'd like to talk to you about today, is because this earth is the Lord, Psalm 24, verse 1 and 2. And just to give you an idea of why creation care is so important, I had the world's worst handwriting. But I'd like to ask you a first question. What is your biggest concern in the world today? What really makes you tick or what you're concerned about? So let's, let's make a list of five, ten things. Anything. 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 Okay. anything that's out there. Anything that's your concern. Maybe something you've talked about it in this class, in this discussion. Go ahead. My biggest concern is just like poverty and the growing wealth of quality. Okay, so poverty. I need to find another pen that writes, but okay. Poverty. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Maybe it's a little more abstract, but a growing sense of indifference. Indifference, okay. Yes? The rights of girls and women. So gender issues, especially women. Okay. Yes? Violence. Can I just say violence, period? Yeah. One more, maybe. Anybody else? Yes? It's somewhat tied to poverty, but a growing income gap. Okay, so. In our own country and all All right, so income gap. I think we'll put that up there. Income gap. Is there another one? Resource gap. Resource gap, okay. Well, let's just stop for there a minute. You know, poverty, indifference. Now, I'll be honest, this is, I understand this one, but I'm going to put my line through it, this one for right now. Because of all those things that you talked about, those four out of five issues are all related right now to what will make them worse and extremely worse is climate change. In fact, I would suggest to you that creation care is the foundational issue of most of the world's social problems. I'm talking about poverty and migration and wealth and women's rights, human trafficking, food scarcity, water scarcity, economics, because it's all related. See, if, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, and go to, look at verses 28, 29, and 30. It talks how, in my belief, in my understanding, how God created a sustainable world. Where there was enough food to eat, where there was enough water and clean water. It was all handed to humanity. But then some little thing happened, and you can think it was one great big idea called, and so some evangelicals or even some fundamentalists say, the fall. But I think all of us would agree that sin is in the world. In fact, one of the interesting things that I like to share with people, does anybody know where some of the first sustainability laws are recorded? How many of you read your Bible at, at least occasionally? <laughs> How many of you probably, what is your least favorite book of the Bible that you've ever heard people talk about? Numbers. Numbers would be close, real close to numbers. 
Leviticus. If you look at Leviticus, there are things like every seventh year, let the land be fallow. How to care for your animals. See, I believe that God knew what he was talking about or God knew what God was talking about. That God gave us an earth, told us in Genesis 2.15 to take care of it, to tend his garden. Our sin messed it up. He reminds us in all these covenant commands in Leviticus, how do we do it? But yet, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, as far as creation care goes, is Isaiah chapter 24, verse 5. My own translation or paraphrase is, human beings pollute the earth because they don't follow God's commands. It's pretty simple. You know, in fact, uh, another resource you can, Ann Alexander is one of my board members. She's an attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council, and she wrote a great Bible study from an attorney's point of view, looking at the contract that God made with the earth and with us and how we are to care for it and to do it, and we have failed miserably. Now, women, I'm, this is something that's just striking to me because I'm a grandfather now, but if you're 13, a 13 year old girl in the United States is likely to develop breast cancer at a rate of one out of eight women most likely connected to plastics, growth hormones, and somatic hormones put into our water. A generation ago, it was one in 30. One out of four children in the United States right now has either asthma, ADHD, autism, or allergies connected to how we care about the environment mainly the use of fossil fuels and petrochemicals. To me, that's not right. Jim mentioned uh, Ben Lowe, who, one of my team members. Ben leads an organization called Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. And, but he is a, you know, he's a wonderful guy, lives in Chicago area, but one of Ben's hobbies is something that I never had the patience to do, and that's to fish. Ben will go fishing anywhere. Even in the Chicago River. A couple years ago, Ben was in the Chicago River fishing. And he says he caught about a two and a half, three pound carp, bottom dweller. And a Latino Hispanic man came up to him and asked him if he could have the fish. And Ben said, you don't want it. It's filled with PCPs and mercury and all sorts of other nasty stuff. But the guy turned to Ben and said, I need it to feed my children. And Ben gave him the fish. But one of the famous lines that I've quoted Ben on, that it's not right that in the United States that someone should have to choose between eating poison and letting his children go hungry. That's why I believe the creation care for us, we call it a matter of life, of human life. And that's why I'd like to go back to looking at these things, especially in terms of climate change. Right now around the world, and you can see it, that every system is being stressed. According to a recent study that came out just two weeks ago, Looking at the timing of climate change from some professors at the University of Hawaii, do you know that we've already surpassed the acidity of the ocean of historic time? And that happened in 2008. The ocean is now more acid than any variability ever. And is that important? Is the ocean being acidic really matter? Well. 60 to 80 percent of our oxygen comes from the ocean. Roughly half the world's protein comes from the, from the ocean. And that level of acidity will destroy just about every coral reef. And it's already happening in Australia and the Caribbean right now. But even more than that, rainfall is changing. 
We just took a bunch of folks to Malawi back in May. We took some Christian leaders and, and they had some wonderful stories and if, if you want to see some of those stories you can actually go to uh, our website creationcare.org and you'll see a couple little blurbs. But one of the most interesting things that happens with climate change is things don't happen like they used to happen. For them in Malawi, they used to get rain every October 15th. It was literally like clockwork. They'd plant the crops, it would rain, they would sprout, they would harvest them in the spring. Well, a year and a half ago, they planted on October 15th and never got a crop, no rain. So they replanted towards the end of November. No crop. They replanted in January and they got a flood and it wiped all the seeds out. See, that's what climate change is doing. It's not necessarily changing the amounts of like rainfall in Malawi, but it's changing the timing of differences. Instead of getting steady natural rains that used to happen, things are happening in these great big variances and differences. Even a couple years ago, here in Washington, if you were around for the great snowstorm, I mean, big snowstorms are going to happen because of climate change, because simply there's more water in the atmosphere. And the things are changing. I live in New Freedom, Pennsylvania. It's about 75 miles from here, right on the Pennsylvania-Maryland line. You know where it's at? Yeah. Cool. Somebody knows where I live. I live in a town that doesn't even have a street light in a 125-year-old house in the middle of a mixed area of town that my wife and I are slowly restoring. But what's so unique, unique about New Freedom is it has the same climate today that Richmond, Virginia had 25 years ago. It's warmer. We don't get as much snow. The rain patterns are different. In 2012, Something happened in New Freedom, Pennsylvania, that at least I had never experienced before in the 24 years that I've lived there. That we had a thunderstorm, at least one, every month, starting in January through December. Now, we're all used to thunderstorms in my neck of the woods, you know, in June and July and August. But the atmosphere is in a turmoil, and that's what's happening. So the interest is why poverty is getting worse is this idea of rain not coming when it's supposed to and temperatures getting hotter. And while you might hear some people say, well, more carbon dioxide is going to help plants to grow better. That's true, but soon the increased heat takes all that advantage away. By about the year 2070, give or take, whose study you believe in, you won't be able to grow wheat or corn in Kansas anymore. In fact, one of the most interesting stories I've ever heard, if you have it a chance, Catherine Hayhoe, who's an evangelical scientist, climate change person, wrote a book with her husband called A Climate for Change. She tells a really good story about in the 1960s about the Soviet Union when it still existed, that one of their scientists came to the Politburo and said, I know how we can end the Cold War. I know how we can beat America. If we put up coal-fired power plants all throughout Siberia, we can heat the temperature of the earth up where Siberia will now be the wheat capital of the world and will burn up Kansas and Nebraska. Would have taken about 50 to 75 years, but he's absolutely correct. They didn't listen to him. The theory of climate science has been around since at least 1896. In fact, the Swede that developed it, my friends who are scientists tell me that his calculations written on pencil and paper are almost as good as the climate models today, 130 years later. He knew what he was talking about. But let's get back to children and poverty. So we've got poverty, which corresponds to water, and let's talk about gender issues. When I first became president of EEN, four years ago, I was reading a story, again, about, for some reason, Malawi is on our heart at EEN. We do a lot of work there. I read the story about a five-year-old girl who made three round trips a day of about four miles each to gather water. And one of the reasons she's getting water is they cut down more forests and the, the atmosphere is changing and the rains are changing. Her water availability was getting further away. And as the least valuable member of her family, 
She was the one that was sent to walk after the water. I can't imagine, I have a grandson who's six years old, I can't imagine sending him off for a four mile walk each way with a pail of water. But they did that because they were afraid of other siblings in the family, especially the older girls, might get raped or stolen. And so the least valuable went off. That's not uncommon throughout the world today, especially still in the, in the rural areas of looking for either water or firewood. There are stories of women who get up at three o'clock in the morning and spend the first three or four hours gathering firewood, then three or four hours looking for water, then cooking food, then caring for the children, then doing whatever farming they can do, and then collapsing sometime later in the day. There is no opportunity for education, for empowerment, for anything. And I would tell you that our changing climate is one of the worst gender issues in the world because still in so many places of the world, women are devalued and are literally slave labor. Val Sheen, who's a Veteran, uh, a veterinarian in Kenya tells this powerful story. She's a good friend of ours. She's lived in Kenya in a village for 20 years. In fact, one of her great stories, besides being a veterinarian and caring for animals, she actually taught two sub-tribes, 20,000 people who were warring, including making child soldiers. She brought them together and was a peacemaker. It was neat. The old elders of, her vi of the villages came to her and said, you care for our animals, you can talk to both sides. And she did. And she made peace. Just because of her faith. But she tells a story a couple years ago, oh, it happened a year or so ago, it's another just climate change story. In fact, she calls this young baby who I'll tell you about her climate child. A woman was gardening in their village where she lives. And for three years, because of the rainfall patterns we just talked about a while ago, could not could not um, grow a crop. And so her husband finally threw her out and blamed her for the failure. So to survive, she went to the neighboring village and started living with a guy. And she became pregnant. And he threw her out. She came back to the village and shortly died after giving birth to this child. And so Val calls her her climate baby. And she is raising her. So the point I'm trying to make is that right now we say there are five critical things that climate change is happening around the world. First is food security. It's making it worse. Second, water security. Extreme weather. Nobody around here heard anything called Sandy what, this week. How many of you know how much climate change impacted New York City last year during Sandy? Yeah, just in New York City alone, sea level rise was eight to nine inches around Manhattan in the five boroughs of New York City. Because of that eight to nine inches of sea level rise in the eight or nine foot storm surge, 50,000 additional people were impacted because of sea level rise. Any of you want to have a, a career in the military or in government? Maybe nobody does here, but the Army Corps of Engineers just came out with a study on Norfolk. That by 2050, Norfolk will be gone. The largest naval base in the world could be underwater with climate change. That's some serious dollars and money. So we have Food scarcity, water scarcity, extreme weather, disease increases. Vector-borne diseases, the worst changes in patterns, of especially malaria, and something really nasty called dengue fever. Now, have you ever heard of dengue fever? It's called bone break fever by most people in the tropics because it feels like every one of your bones is going to break. It's increasing. In fact, one of the interesting things that are happening, and um, try that. And this gentleman's going to give me some glasses, so I'm going to take those back. That's fine. Oops, except I, I can. Yeah, we'll work on that in a minute. Um, the 
Dengue fever, in fact, Catherine Hayhu, I mentioned earlier, who's the climate modeling scientist, and one of her friends who's also um, some type of human disease specialist, just did a study on dengue fever in the United States. And it's really interesting, it's one of the facts that's going to happen, is it's going to skip over Florida and primarily Texas because actually because of climate change, it's going to be too hot for the mosquitoes to live in a really potential serious outbreak of dengue fever in the next 30 years could happen throughout the upper Midwest, especially Chicago. Never before happened of having mosquitoes that have dengue fever in Chicago. So we have food, water, extreme weather, forced migration. Anybody know who the first climate refugees in the world are and where they're located? Now, well, you could think about that from time to time, but you're actually close. In modern day, in the 21st century, the first climate refugees will probably be Native Americans from Newtok, Alaska, a village of 350 people because that the ice doesn't form anymore. Their whole shoreline is gone, and they're going to be forced to be moved. That doesn't talk about the Maldives or some of the South Pacific Islands or Bangladesh. By 2050, we could have 50 million more additional people on the move just because of climate change. Talking about economy, and I'm going to mention one other thing here before we move on and talk about where we're at policy-wise and have some more engagement from you folks. Um, the U United, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just came out with a report first part of the report a couple weeks ago on climate change being extremely likely to happen. Thank you, Jim. But yesterday, a report was leaked out of saying the human impacts of climate change. And you can take a look at that. In fact, I sent that around to you, was sent around to you yesterday. One of the things that's actually that, that people laugh at and scoff at, which I think you should really pay attention to around here, and it really centers on that issue of violence, it's climate change causes wars. And people laugh at it, but it's true. Some guys from Sanford two years ago or three years ago actually wrote a study that for every one degree of temperature rise in Africa, you get about a 10% increase in violence. And it's not because the temperature's just getting warmer. It's because of the other things that are happening, of the water scarcity and the food scarcity. If you can't feed your children or yourselves, you're going to probably take it from other people. It's not that hard. That's what wars have been fought over for years. And we're seeing that increased violence everywhere. Test question, how many people leave Mexican farmland every year because the farms are drying up and turning in the deserts. Somebody take a guess. Per year. Per year. Let's go higher. Let's go higher. Let's go higher. Let's go lower. One million. Approximately a million people move off of Mexican farmland every year because of desertification. And you think of why you talk about immigration issues in the United States, you talk about the drug issues in the United States, you talk about the size growing of Mexico City and all the urban areas in the world. It's because people are moving and looking for jobs and ways to carry their family. And again, I would suggest to you, even back as far as human trafficking, do you think a father would really sell his daughter or his son to slavery if he could already care for them? The answer is probably not. Some might. So that leads me to go back to what are we doing, why creation care really is a matter of life. And so I've laid that out for you, so I want to talk about some policy issues now that we can talk about and continuing up right now. Unfortunately, in the United States, we've had this great big denial front about climate change, well-funded. And maybe just to give you a way to start, how much 
in simple terms does the United States government give to fossil fuel companies every year? Yep. Grants, yep. What's that? Oh, man. I take that. The, the, the simple answer is $6 billion. That's if you just group direct tax rebates and costs of drilling and things like that. If you look at people like my son who just spent two years in Afghanistan and other things, you could get into the hundreds of billions of dollars quickly. But in simple tax terms, we give tax breaks to oil, fossil fuels, to about $6 billion a year. Compare that to the amount of money and tax credits we give to renewables, which if you add them all up is less than about one and a half billion dollars a year. What we tell people is a policy issue, one of the greatest things that could happen is let's remove all tax subsidies from all sorts of energy. And let's let them play in an even market field. I don't know about you, but six billion dollars would be a nice chunk of change either to put into energy research or to other issues or just to do nothing about it. To let it pay the debt down. There's all sorts of good things you could do with it. And see, I think, and the reason I highlight that is that's one of the reasons that climate change is such an issue. And it's really, we're at a point of a revolutionary change in the world. It's the same change that happened when we stopped using firewood to drive steam engines. How many of you know that, any of you from Pennsylvania? Anybody from Virginia? Have any of you been to the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia? Skyline Road, trail. Okay, falling down short here. <laughs> Do you know until the 1930s that there was basically no trees in the Shenandoah Mountains? They had all been cut down for either firewood or lumber. In Pennsylvania, the same thing was true where I live. It wasn't until the Great Depression and the Civilian Conservation Corps went to work planting trees that we have trees today in the Blue Ridge Mountains because we cut them all down and used them up for fuel. So we made this switch, and, and I would think that when they first started using coal, there were a lot of woodcutters who were very irate that they were losing their income. Do well, you think that's probably true? And then when we went from coal, we started using oil. I'll bet there were a lot of blacksmiths very unhappy when we started having cars. And see, now we're to that same point again, too, where people that have the existing technology for fossil fuels, whether it's oil or natural gas or even coal, we're looking at making a revolutionary, revolutionary shift to something different. But when you make that shift, how would you like to be the producer of eight-track audio tapes? Now, some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. They were little things you put in a cassette in your car back in the 60s and 70s, before there were even cassette tapes, well before there were even CDs. Nobody had even heard of MP3 players. I just came back from Boston uh, this morning. I was up there with the Administrator Gina McCarthy from the EPA. Um, and I lived in Boston for three years. And one of the things when I used to drive from, I lived in Plymouth. And I used to drive um, up the South Expressway, the Southeast Expressway into Boston and Braintree, and there was this old brick building there, and it had the word Keystone on it. None of you probably have any idea what that was, but I do because I'm an old fogey. Keystone were the largest manufacturers of home movie projectors. Home movie projectors don't exist anymore. And so what we're seeing out of the fossil fuel industry and the money that they're laying down to fight climate change and deny it is simply a way to preserve their market share and to profitize their stuff. It's very simple. It's basic economics. 
A year and a half ago, we had a major fight for the mercury and air toxic standard. If you don't know this, one in six children are born in the United States with enough mercury in their bloodstreams to cause brain damage. Sometimes it's only 10 or 20 IQ points, sometimes it's a lot more. Coal-fired power plants fought for 20 years not to put on the controls to regulate that mercury. And it went to the, House, or the Senate to be try to be stopped. And it was only stopped, or we only got the mercury rule in place by four votes in the Senate. The reason why? Because the coal-fired utility industry in the United States knew that a shift in fuels was coming up called natural gas. They wanted to preserve the length of their investment of these 30 and 40 year old coal fired plants as long as they could do it and not put any regulation or any more money into them. So again, they maximized their profits using old equipment until many of them now have switched to natural gas to prevent that because natural gas right now is cheap and we won't even talk about fracking. That's to say, that's where we're at in the United States today. We have the competing interest of people wanting to maintain their profits of an old industry, facing the potential of new industries coming online in sustainable energy, and caught right in the middle is the world. We believe, and in all seriousness, that climate change is the greatest threat to humanity in the world. Not to the planet itself, the planet will cure itself eventually, but it's to the people of the world. Somewhere today, between 150 and 3,000 people die because of climate change around the world today, and we're just at the beginnings of it. You folks will have a mess in your hands, and as we start acting. And what we're trying to do is develop the moral voice, the biblical voice, to get people to fire up to take this over literally to defeat and to do action on climate change will require the same effort as the civil rights movement all over again. So we have to create this kind of moral, literally moral majority, moral movement of people that are concerned about our children, concerned about people here today, because the impacts are already here, and the people around the world. So with that, I hope I've shared with you that climate change is real, that creation care is a foundational issue for every area of social justice and biblical values, and that the earth is God's. But before I sit down, I'd like to leave you with one last thing. For me, in my faith, and I, I am not a religious person, but I am a very faithful Christian or as faithful as I can be with God's help. I believe that as Jesus said when he was talking to the guy about how a rich man gets through the eye of the needle, well, human beings can't do it, but with God, all things are possible. So I don't want to say this is not without hope because we can change it, but we have to start acting now. Last year, Actually, this week last year, the British accounting firm PricewaterhouseCoopers, also here, came out with a study called Two Degrees Too Late. They said starting in 2013 through 2050, we would have to reduce carbon or become more carbon efficient by about 5% every year for that next 25, 30 years, 35 years. That's a job, but we have done it before. Anybody want to take a guess when the United States got that most efficiency in doing things? World War II. You got it. Absolutely. And so the only way we can do it is when we come together as a people and make this a bipartisan issue, and it's not about politics, it's about human life and human health. And with that, I will sit down and we can have some more discussion. How would that be? <laughs> Now, uh, what was most striking to me was how Mitch started. Everything that we've talked about, we've done, uh, this, this course does uh, faith, social justice, 
and a public life. Mm -hmm. And then we apply it to different issues. And this year it's been poverty, immigration, race, climate, and next war and peace. So what you're saying is you take all those issues and add, we've talked about trafficking, we've talked about lots of related issues, that climate change isn't just another issue to discuss. Uh, pick the issue you like best and work on that. But climate change, or I love the Isaiah text as well, that polluting the, polluting the world is disobedience to God. That's what Isaiah is saying. Mm -hmm. That it makes everything worse, exacerbates, uh, increases violence, conflict, uh, exploitation of women and girls, all that makes it worse. So that's, that's a whole framework about climate that isn't just, um, uh, as the critics will say, tree hugging mm -hmm. or something, right? Also was struck by how you said, uh, I didn't know this, that the planet by itself might find some way to adjust over time. Uh, but people are the real um, uh, casualties here. So I'm going to ask you to unpack that a bit, then turn it over to you to jump in with your questions, okay? So uh, that makes sense, and I had never thought of it quite that way. The planet, how would the planet adjust to climate change without people? But why can't we adjust that way as human beings in the same way as some critics would say, right? They would say we can adjust, we can all adjust, right? I think the easiest way to explain that is if you're not afraid of being an old earth person. Um, in my community, there are a lot of people that believe that the earth is young, you know, less than 5,000 years old. But I actually tell people that, you know, my job when I was an undergraduate was dating rocks. You're supposed to laugh, dating rocks. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. I, I actually worked in a, in a uh, radiometric... Uh, <coughs> age dating laboratory. But what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs was a great big meteor probably hit the planet. That's what most scientists tell us today. The earth wasn't destroyed, but life then was completely changed and altered. And so by that same token with climate changes happening, even for the CO2 that we put in the air today, it's going to last hundreds of years. And so the more we stop putting it in, the less pollution we do, the earth will return to normal. But even with that, Humanity probably will not survive as we do today just because, you know, the polar ice caps are melting, both of them. No matter what you read in the paper, the Arctic is definitively shrinking in all of its sea ice. And there have been a lot of hogwash in the newspapers about how the Antarctic sea ice is growing. Well, that's true. The Art Arctic Antarctic sea ice has grown a little bit, but the most ice in Antarctica is on the land and it's shrinking at the rate of two cubic miles a year. That water will completely change all of our sea level, will change the whole hydrologic cycle. So again, the earth of itself will survive, but the adaptation for humanity, because the people that are on the earth, because of where they live, and forced migrations, I mean, we already have enough trouble right now trying to pass an immigration law in the United States that makes sense. Can you imagine if in the next hundred years, five or six billion people are forced to move where they're currently living because of climate change? Talk about conflict and war. So hopefully that unpacks that a little bit for you to go forward. Okay, let me throw it over to you. Yeah, Peter. Oh, well, first, I just have a, a, a question about something you said, not really related to the environment at all, but it uh, relates to my second question. Uh, and you said that you're, uh, you're not religious, but you're faithful. And I, I'm just curious what you mean by that, especially as a pastor. Um, what, how, do you, how, do you, how are you using those words, I guess? Jesus, when he came, and this is from my very evangelical perspective, came to us... <coughs> to shake up the status religious institutions. And I believe today, especially in the United States and other places, so much of even Christianity has turned into an institution instead of something that's alive. And I believe a faithful person is the one who 
allows Christ into their life, who transforms them, gives them a job to do to build his kingdom. And don't worry about human institutions, but are alive, live, have Christ living inside of them. So that's where I come from. I'm a radical in that regard. I guess my, my question then, uh, obviously this class is about faith, um, faith, not religion, I guess, and uh, public life. But to me, it seems uh, to change at least our, our American uh, dialogue about this issue, it's going to take a, 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 a large social change of heart on the issue. And one possible way of, of uh, encouraging that or, or a catalyst for that change of heart to me seems to be religion. Um, and faith, but mm -hmm. uh, and religion as an institution, and that, I think that's part of why I asked the question. I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are about that, and uh, I, I kind of have a related question. Um, how do you respond to uh, certain evangelical Christians who uh, are on the far opposite side of this conversation, um, who interpret the scripture very differently, um, uh, saying that God actually has granted us dominion over the earth and that that dominion means uh, a very specific thing that we can do whatever we want. Let me start with your, your first one, your last question first. You know, the unpacking the word dominion, we could be here for all day, but if you read some of the things that I passed out to you, you get a sense of looking at dominion through the eyes. And the most simple answer is, is this, the word that's translated dominion is the same word that gives the kings the authority of Israel. And as Israel's kings were always meant to shepherd their people, to be the guide. Um, in fact, one of the things, if you really want to see a great explanation of that, um, the word dominion being unpacked, Google Eugene Peterson in Creation Care. A couple of months ago, um, a Canadian Christian station interviewed him talking all about Creation Care at his home in Montana, and he gives probably the best answer I've ever seen on unpacking that word. But to get back to this, how do you deal with the people that are on the other side of this issue that are the more fundamentalists? Did any of you have a chance to read my letter to Rush Limbaugh? I believe as the church how we respond to people that that is in love. I very intentionally, I mean I had, when Rush Limbaugh said that on the radio a couple months ago, I had everybody and their brother literally calling me up or emailing saying, Mitch, how are you going to respond to this? What are you going to do? Are you going to really, you know, put a sword into them? And first I wasn't going to respond at all, but then I really literally prayed through it. And I think I spent 18 years being a pastor for a reason. And that was to respond in the way Jesus would respond. To say, you know, Rush, I believe you're wrong. What you even said was not in love with what Christ calls us to do and I'm gonna ask you to start loving and pray for you. Because I think one of the greatest things in American life right now, even in church life, and we reflect it in our politics and everything else, is we've lost the opportunity to be civil to one another. And if the church can't be civil to itself, even people who are, have a whole different understanding of what the scriptures say than I do, I am commanded to love them by God and so how do we do that? I mean, I can tell you, I mean, my greatest nemesis is a guy by the name of Cal Beisner. You know, he wrote a video series. He, he runs a little outfit called the Cornwall Alliance. And he is a fundamentalist, Calvinist, libertarian. He drives me absolutely bananas. And not only that, he's brilliant. I've been on the radio with him. I've done it. When I first came to this job, and did it. I called him up the phone and said, Cal, can we pray together? So we started praying together once a month. That lasted for three months until he tore my head off in public. I waited a couple months, went back and prayed to him. Same thing happened again. Last year, there's a thing called the Evangelical Theological Society, meaning it's mainly more conservative people, and the whole issue was on creation care, and he gave one of the plenary speeches, and uh, some other friends of mine gave other ones, and I gave a paper there, too. I went up and prayed for him right before he spoke, said, you know, do it. 
And the first words out of the mouth is how that I'm not a Christian. And so, you know, I just shook my head and said, you know, God help me. So I don't do it, but I do like to make a joke out of it. And when, today I'm all dressed in black because I was too lazy to do it. And I actually want to mimic my buddy Jim, who always doesn't have a tie on or collar. But um, when I go and speak in churches, usually the first thing I do, I dress all in green. And I say that some people call me the green dragon, like cow, but really I'm the jolly green giant. <laughs> so it's responding in love. But the last question you had is that people of faith are the difference and have to be the difference. And we have to message to them and get them to understand that this is a biblical value. 26% of the country professes to be evangelical according to Pew. Another 24% says that they're Roman Catholic. And I contend in a lot of things why we haven't gotten more information, more job done on climate change. We've allowed the dialogue to change quite honestly on some pretty liberal policy lines that don't really attune to a lot of conservative Christians and we don't use their language or biblical language to reach out to them. That's why if you talk to a lot of conservatives in the United States today, they will say that climate change is not a matter of science. It's a pure matter of politics. They won't even listen to the science because they've already framed it as a liberal social issue. And so our job is to make it a biblical issue. And then we can talk about ways of being that what we call the All-American Plan, coming together as a country to solve it. Let me say a word about your first part of the question, then I want to go back to you to say more about what you just started to say, about why, what ways of framing this in policy ways uh, from perhaps a liberal side don't work for conservative people. Uh, somebody, uh, there's a New York Times new best-selling book called Jesus with a sign better than religion. Have you seen that? It was a young guy who made a video and he got 21 million hits in 48 hours or something or a week. And so out of the video, and he was just literally a young guy who had this rap thing he'd done and a friend says, you should, we should film that. And so his friend filmed it, went up on YouTube, he got 23 million hits. So now it's a New York Times bestseller. It won't stay there long because, uh, well, it, it, it's, it lacks some depth and substance, but the point is Jesus and religion are different. And someone asked me the other day, a young person said, well, what you talk about, the kind of faith that you believe in, that can only rise up from the grassroots, right, outside institutions, right? This won't happen within religious institutions. I said, well, the Catholic Church, last I checked, was pretty institutional and pretty hierarchical and patriarchal, all the rest. And yet, there's a new pope who probably is, is, is reinvigorating a conversation about the meaning of the gospel and Jesus and what it means to live like Jesus more than maybe anybody in the world right now. And he's the head of this institution. So even within the institution, uh, these voices can be raised. So it isn't as clean as outside and inside institutions, but it really is a, what you're saying. What he's saying, what the Pope is saying and doing, is so contrary to much of his institution. And we've talked about the Pope here at, at mm -hmm. some length. So uh, there really is a difference between faith, Jesus, spirituality, whatever you want to say, and religion. Religion becomes the institution that sort of frames this notion of faith. Uh, Wesleyan revival became the Methodist Church. And so that's always a conversation. It's never the right place be outside or inside. It's what you're saying and doing and how faithful that is to what you say your faith means. So I'm curious to hear more about what you just said, how the way the issue is framed in this country or by policymakers or on the liberal side, because that's where it normally comes from, mm -hmm. and how that impacts more conservative people who you think really could be, should be, and are open to this in a different frame. When you think, and I'll ask you a question. When I say the word climate change, what political leader first comes to your mind? Exactly. And that's where the issue became framed and really started to be polarized. I mean, the former vice president is a man of faith. And his really heart is in the right place. But because of where we're at in the, na the nation, he became the foil for the money against it. So 
the biggest things you talk about, and let's talk about the failed cap and trade bill that was out there, which was a disaster waiting to happen. But the issue becomes climate change, the only way to solve climate change, first off, in the many eyes of most people in this town and around the country, is what? Government. Big government going to tell me what to do. So that's an immediate poor frame of getting it going. So you have a very liberal politician who was defeated in a very close election, and we all know the Chad stories, at least some of us will actually live through it here. Some of you probably didn't, or were just not old enough to remember that. You had big government issue, and we all know what's happening in the terms of Tea Party and other things right now, and the portrayal that it's been about the planet and about animals, which is slowly changing. When you think about it, Who's been the iconic picture for climate change in a lot of the media in the past five years? Polar bears. Do you think people in conservative America who are worrying about their jobs and about how much gas it costs them to go to their jobs really care about a polar bear? They don't. So, to be effective on changing climate change, we have to turn the debate to things like human health and our children's health. For me, it is a pro-life issue. I am a very pro-life person. I believe in pro-life from conception to natural death. And that's, while I'm not going to beat people over the head about a different theology, that's my frame of reference. So all I can do to protect human life something that's very important to me. So I think we have to talk whether it's completely use the term pro-life or you talk about you know unborn children and born children, the impacts on our children. And, you know even though we've had dramatic cleanup in our air around here, I live in central Pennsylvania. The core they measure from York to Harrisburg still gets failing grades for ozone most summers. Do you know what increased temperatures will do to the ozone levels and therefore to the asthma levels? There are 60,000 kids at risk in central Pennsylvania where I live at alone. And as the temperature gets warmer, it just will cause that asthma rate. And that's just a simple thing of asthma in some particulates. We're not talking about sea level rise or food prices rise or any of that other stuff. It's already an impact. So what we have to start talking about in fact, the language that EEN is starting to use, and it was actually a God-given thing. I was on a um, press conference right after the president's um, June speech, and I was asked, um, well, isn't the, the president's speech on climate and carbon regulations, isn't that really just a war on coal? And I said, I don't see it as a war on coal, but defending our children's health, and gave the reasons. And so that's why we have to change the message. We have to change the dialogue to back to this moral framework. Imagine if the symbol of for climate change wasn't a polar bear on an um, iceberg, but a uh, uh, migrant, migrant labor camp on an iceberg. <laughs> you know, you had a, a people in a migration camp floating on an iceberg. Very different feeling to that. Well, I would suggest even greater than that from the United States audience that one of the most terrible problems in the United States with birth defects is auto exhaust. There have been now four major studies in the United States linking birth defects, especially in urban areas around freeways, to auto exhaust, which is another thing we have to address. It's one of the reasons we really fought hard for the, um, it's called the tier three gas standards of taking a lot of sulfur out of gasoline. But because of that, I mean, the picture that you want to call is, is you know, we are literally poisoning our children to death with fossil fuels. And that's the picture that we have to start thinking about, is how do we overcome that? How do we live a life that gives our children to have the great chance for abundant life that Christ promised us, as well as we've had or even beyond that? Questions?
Michelle, go ahead. What do you, so you've talked a lot about why uh, it's, sorry, thank you. Um, we've talked a lot about why it's important to care for the earth and to attempt to prevent climate change. What do you see as the most um, productive way to go about doing that, um, both politically and then in terms of um, just actual action items? Sorry, thank you. I believe in a, in a market-based economy, and I think the easiest way to do something with addressing climate change is first going to be to set the price of carbon in a place, some type of carbon tax that's going to take up for the external costs that we already have. Let me give you a really simple example. In the United States, even right today, the cost of producing electricity from coal anywhere ranges from depending on where you're at in technology, four to five to seven, sometimes as high as 10 cents a kilowatt. The mid-range external cost for that electricity, the externalities, the health costs, the children's life, the roads that people use to haul coal trucks on that don't get any tax on them, the mid-range is 17 cents a kilowatt. So in reality, we're paying right now I live in Pennsylvania. Um, Coal-fired power in my house is eight cents a kilowatt. Since I live in a state that has switch, I buy wind power for eight and a half cents a kilowatt. So eight plus 17 is 25 cents a kilowatt. I figure I'm getting a great economic bargain by not paying those external costs. And so what we have to do is get the level of fossil fuel prices up to reach those costs, those external costs. Right now, you can get solar electricity for about eight, nine cents a kilowatt, and within five years, it'll be down to four or five cents a kilowatt. We're already seeing wind power on commercial scale at seven cents a kilowatt. So we have to basically, since the market isn't doing anything for us in that terms of being a fair price in carbon, we have to set it. So that's the first thing we have to do. And I think the last, and then we can even all have to be smart. You know, we have to be good consumers. We have to buy our foods locally. You know, we think about going as best we can organically or free of chemicals the best we can be. And, and watching our energy stuff, I often tell high school kids, and it's true, if you turn off every electrical appliance off or unplug it or have a smart power strip, you can save 5% of your energy right off the top. Churches one of the most inefficient buildings in the world. Every church building can save, with caulking and window scale, about six or seven percent of their energy bill. With a little bit of work, they can save 25 or 30 percent. Those are some things we can do right now. And then the, the other thing is that I'm really promoting and we're looking at is, is how do we go to sustainable energy and electricity worldwide? Because there's no doubt about it that you know, one billion people in the world have no access to electricity. Another two billion or so get it maybe three hours a day. And I believe that electricity is the largest single problem that we've not been more successful in economic development. And so if we have people to empower them with wind power or mini hydro or, or solar, that we can have better education and we can have computers and we can have better health care and all sorts of those things, water and pumps and, and, pure th and you know, purifying water. So energy is the number one thing that I would, that we need to address to have sustainable growth. And I'll offer a plug uh, for a book or a video series if you want to take a look at it that's really good. Um, Earth, the Operator's Manual. Um, it was a PBS video series, and Richard Alley wrote a book beside it. Richard Alley is one of the world's leading climate scientists. He's actually a geophysicist from Penn State University. He's also a man of faith. He was part of the Nobel Prize winning team. And if you want to understand climate change and energy, you know, in your spare time since you're college students, I know you have lots of it, that you can go out and get that. But I would recommend that book because it explains energy and climate change better than any other resource there is.
Question, yeah, great. Um, so the Pew Research Center just came out with a poll last week that said Tea Party Americans are the only like majority of, uh, or group that still don't believe in climate change. They're at 25% and everyone else is at 60 or higher. So with a group that's so basically anti-government and climate change is obviously something we're gonna need to address using with government, how do you kind of go, how do you wanna, how do you think we can address that? If I had all the answers to that, we'd be in good shape. Because right now, and, and, and here's a good political answer. Um, earlier this year, my staff and I went to somewhere around 65 to 70 Republican House offices and talked to either representatives or to their senior staff level and asked them particularly about climate change. And one of the things that became so evident there was that most of the Republicans believed that climate change was real. They were afraid of being primaried out by the Tea Party. And so how do we overcome that? I think we have to go back to the concept I talked about a little while earlier and have the moral movement, the biblical movement, that understands that climate change is real and that will take action and whose voice will be louder than the Tea Party demanding action. And I think we can do that and I think in some places we've already done that, but that's what it's gonna take because otherwise we've lost, I don't think that the House of Representatives because of redistricting, redistricting will change for 10 years. So we're gonna have the same primaries, the same people, so if we're gonna have the same setup, the only thing we can hope for is a transformation of the people. And I believe with God's help, we can do that. Um, can I ask a follow-up? No, please. Um, just kind of going off that, so like half the Tea Party, about half is evangelical. So do you think the way to kind of change those who are evangelical and Tea Parties through coming from other evangelicals, trying to influence them, or who, who's gonna kind of be able to change them? I think it is through faith, is one of the portions doing it, but there's also something else that works very well for evangelical Christians and for Tea Party people. And we've actually seen some movement out of this in the past month down in Georgia, in Arizona to be specific, where there were real fights on the public utility commissions in Georgia, and there's gonna be a vote in Arizona about the use of solar panels on houses. I don't know if you saw that, but the Tea Party actually started, in fact, they're calling it the Green Tea Party because they see solar energy as a way of independence and more free market. And so with that kind of language, people are becoming engaged in it by saying, look, you know, why can't I put up solar panels on my house and then charge it back to the utility company? Because that's the problem. The, the, again, you know how we talked about earlier today about um, technology changing markets and people being left behind? Well, the, the utilities in the United States are in danger of being left behind because of, and it's the same thing that happened in the past 15 years with something called cell phones. Would AT&T and Verizon exist today if they were still dependent on the majority of the revenue coming from landlines? And the answer is no. If you go to any place in the majority world, there isn't landlines and there never will be. And so distributed power independently produced is the wave of the future. And utilities are doing all they can to ensure that their market share won't go away when people put up their own windmills and their own you know, solar cells and have their many own little hydro plants. And you know, we, we're, we're a couple years away from that, but not very far. We need some more smart grid technology. We need some better batteries. But that technology is coming. Uh, and again, when you fight to preserve your market share, instead of reinvesting in new markets, you make a mistake. A couple years ago, Bill Gates and a few others put out a business plan for a clean energy future. And they're saying the technology is one of the ways we can get out of this, and I think they're right. But it's interesting is that the pharmaceutical industry puts about 18% of its gross sales back into research the energy industry puts less than three-tenths of one percent into research. 
So they're relying on this past highly intensive capital to go out there in maximizing their benefits instead of reinvesting. And I believe we should have smart people out there reinvesting their capital into make products. I mean, did Apple only stay with a computer? I mean, where does the majority of their sales come from today? From iPhones, not the computer. I mean, it's so easy to become, especially as fast as the world moves, to be technologically obsolete. And so we have to keep reinventing that. And I say that overcoming that with smart people and being true business people instead of being protectionist is the greatest way we can overcome climate. Yeah, Colleen. Um, so you mentioned that there were five kind of critical issues, including poverty and women and gender um, issues. And I think it's something that's so interesting about climate change and so many <coughs> issues is that they are so all interconnected. Um, so I'm just curious how you can, like how in terms of solution you think, solutions you think we can kind of tie in um, solving environmental problems, but at the same time working to kind of solve these other problems. Um, and then my second question is, I think a lot of times the environmental movement focuses on like wealthier communities because they have the resources to shop organic and do all those things. So how can we kind of expand the movement to include a, like diversity of people and like the whole like human family, but also how can we make sure that, I think a lot of times people see an issue of it's just the environment, but how can we kind of bring interconnected solutions to the table? I'll go with, again, the, your last question first. There are a lot of really great organizations that are working in inner cities and even rural areas for healthy farming practices. You know, a good friend of mine out in San Diego is teaching herb in San Diego, in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, has started an urban gardens program that's fantastic. It's teaching kids in elementary school, number one, where does food come from, how to eat healthy and produce their own things, and there are a wide variety of people that are doing that. Um, and I think we need to pay attention to that. Um, and you're right, I mean, the poor folk in this country have been the brunt of environmental disaster after environmental disaster. You know, the, the folks in our language call that environmental justice. You know, they've been the recipient of toxic dumps and all the rest of it. And they're going to be the worst ones to suffer from climate change right now. I mean, you know, have any of you been to the Ninth Ward after Katrina? I mean, I helped build houses there. I was there during the Gulf oil spill. You know, New Orleans will not exist in another 20 years. And still, the majority of people that live in New Orleans are people who are poor. And so they do go hand in hand, and I think we need to recognize that and do that and, and stand up for that. But the teaching part of it and, and helping people to live healthy lives is definitely, you know, something we're already seeing happening. And I think it starts from the shift that, you know, that how we name it as an organization, the creation care is a matter of life. And we did that very intentionally. I mean, that was to get people not to be thinking about trees and tree huggers and, you know, while biodiversity is important in my community, people don't care as much for whatever bug squasher is going to be ruined by TVA to their children's health. An answer to your technology question or developing the world's resources, I go back to the energy independence thing. The largest way to empower women and all people in the world is to get them reliable electricity or some kind of energy that will improve their lives. And how we do that, whether we stay, hopefully not with some type of fossil fuel, or we go to some type of sustainable energy. I mean, 85% of African wood that's cut down is used as fuel. Still, the largest single thing that heats homes and cooks food in the world is charcoal. A million kids die every year from smoke inhalation and asthma from indoor cooking. More women get burned severely in Africa from open cooking fires that have HIV AIDS every year. So if we come up with sustainable energy that is really neat, in fact, you might want to do it, I don't know if it will happen because of our dysfunctional Congress. But the one organization, and, and we're supporting them in this, have introduced a bill in Congress called Electrifying Africa, which doesn't cost any money, but just redirects some of USAID's funding to deal with electricity in Africa particular. And it's a great concept, because 
you know, we've been fighting this battle for years. I, I used to go to USAID and say, when are we going to get some projects for sustainable energy? Oh, we're not going to do that because they think it's going to require central generating stations and millions and millions of dollars. And I said, you're thinking old school. Think cell phones. Think distributed power. Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, called last year the year of sustainable energy. And he actually got a lot of the world thinking about it. And so the easiest way, in my opinion, to overcome climate change and to help people live good, productive lives and increase their life is sustainable energy that's available for all people. We had a meeting around this very table uh, last year at Georgetown uh, where uh, African bishops were at the table along with environmentalists. I think you were here. Yeah, I was sitting right beside you. Right. And, uh, and they called this project Let There Be Light. Mm -hmm. Remember? Let There Be Light. And they told um, uh, incredible stories like Mitch is telling about women who were, they were now saved three or four hours uh, to travel. And the charcoal was changed with, with uh, safe mm -hmm. cooking, cooking stoves. And solar power, in this case, solar power was providing electric power. And it was amazing how, that, how those technical changes were changing people's lives in enormous ways. And here were very, there were very old traditional mm -hmm. bishops and church leaders saying, this is what's changing the lives of people in my community. There'll never be electrical lines in those African countries. So this is where we have to make some choices.